The wait is over. On February the 27th, the UFC makes its much-anticipated return to London. A sellout crowd from here at the O2 Arena will witness the homecoming of Michael the Count Bisbee as he takes on one of the greatest of all time, Anderson the Spider Silver. Welcome to UFC Breakdown. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Legendary lives on in London with two of the biggest names in the game. We'll be taking a closer look at some of their best performances in Fight Focus. Dan Hardy demonstrates just what makes the skill and styles of both of these fighters so special when we take things on the mat. We catch up with British fan favourite Brad One Punch Pickett ahead of his homecoming fight. And we are joined in studio by film director and UFC fanatic Noel Clark and editor of Fighters Only magazine Nick Peets to get their views on Fight Night London. I'm joined as ever by Dan Hardy. Dan, this is a huge event and, and that main event, a real treat for the fight fans. It, it is a special fight. I mean, Michael Bisping has been carrying the standard for UK mixed martial arts for a long time. He's paved the way for a lot of fighters that are sharing the card with him on the night. And Anderson Silva, I mean, one of the best fighters that's ever lived, one of the best martial artists that's ever lived. And he's fighting the, one of the best fighters that's ever come out of the UK in London. It's a real special night. Very special indeed. Well, 2002 was the first time that the UFC held a UK event. Back then, only four fighters represented the UK in front of a fairly modest crowd. Fast forward 14 years, and we have a show brimming with local talent, all looking to showcase their skills in front of a capacity crowd at the Ota Arena. On February 27th, the O2 Arena will be the focus of the MMA world as the UFC makes its return to London. A card brimming with homegrown talent and a headline fight between two of the most pivotal members in UFC history. The event sold out in a matter of minutes and is fast becoming one of the most highly anticipated nights in European UFC history. It is the 16th UFC event in the British Isles and the eighth in London a love affair with the sport that began with the UK's historic debut event in 2002. 5,000 fans descended on the Royal Albert Hall to witness Matt Hughes defend his welterweight title against Carlos Newton at UFC 38, Brawl in the Hall. But it wasn't the battle for the belt that stole the headlines that night. Standout performances from Englishman Ian the Machine Freeman and Mark the Wizard Weir ignited the crowd and shone a light on a new breed of sports stars. Since then, the UK has produced a string of fighters who have enjoyed international success. Former title contender Dan Hardy, Ultimate Fighter winner Ross Pearson, and top contender Jimmy Manua are a select few of the standout performers from the UK who have played a vital part in a decorated history littered with success. No matter where I am in the world, England's in my heart. Nine fighters from the UK will feature on the card in London. Fittingly headlined by one of the UFC's most prevalent figures, Englishman Michael the Count Bisbee. Just teeing away is Michael Bisbee. I will perform. I will give you what you paid to see. Since winning the Ultimate Fighter in 2006, Bisbee shot to fame with a brash personality and crowd-pleasing fight style, which has lit up highlight reels for a decade. Bisbee hammering away. Fellow veteran Brad Pickett joins Bisping in leading an army of the UK's next generation of fighters who have all been making plenty of noise on the world stage. The UK's presence in the UFC has seemingly never been stronger and the current crop's hottest prospects will all be on show in London. Tom Breeze still undefeated victory in his Octagon debut from Arnold Allen. The UK contingent will take on the world with a backing of over 17,000 fans as they step into the octagon at the O2 Arena. Dan, there's lots of reasons to get excited about this card, from the main event to the supporting cast yeah. of British fighters who are at very different stages of their career. Yeah, we have a lot of good fighters coming through. And, and you know, this is really a resurgence of, of, of uh, UK mixed martial arts. We've been overshadowed somewhat by the successes of other countries. Obviously, Poland now got a champion. Uh, Ireland's doing very well. 
but we've got some real strong talent in the UK and we're going to see it on this night. OK, well, let's take a look at the prelims then. And we can see a whole host of British names there at different weight classes as well. Yes, yeah, well, Arnold Allen's the one that comes to mind. You know, he's right early on in his UFC career. He has a lot of potential. He's a good athlete. He's very strong. Likewise, we've got Bradley Scott. We've got Scott Ascom. We've got Davy Grant. The other one that comes to mind, obviously, is Mike Wilkinson, who we've not seen as active as I think he should be uh, due to injuries or whatever. But again, you know, a win here gets the ball rolling for a good 2016. So, Dan, let's take a look at the main card then. And it's a very, very important night for the middleweight pitcher. But also, there are some really fun fights. There are. Brad Pickett, you know, is a fan favourite. He always brings it. He always puts the pressure on his opponents. And, you know, everyone likes to watch him fight. He's got a very, very tough fight in front of him, though. And, he, and he's going to perform, I'm sure, because he's, he's in London. He always puts on his best here. And then the other guy is always Tom Breeze. We've spoke about yeah. him in the past. He's the best prospect we've got in this country right now. I think he's a very talented guy. He's a huge welterweight. And he's just looked unstoppable so far in his UFC career. I think we're going to see big things from him this year. OK, well, time now for a quick break. But when we come back, we'll be taking a closer look at the main event. These two have been on a collision course for many, many years. And it's finally going to go down right here in London. Welcome back to UFC Breakdown. Today is all about the upcoming fight nights at the O2 Arena in London. Headlining the event is a middleweight matchup between Michael Bisbing and Anderson Silva, two of the most storied careers in all of UFC history and two very exciting fight styles. Chris Lehman goes That's down it. again wow. and it is all over! Wow. And it's all over! Of course I was aware of Anderson Silva. He came over to the UFC, he made a lot of noise. He became the champion very quickly and he, he was extremely dominant as a champion. So of course, I always had my eyes on Anderson. I always saw him as a future opponent. I always knew that my style would give him a nightmare. Just teeing away is Michael Bisping. Down he goes! My movement is too much. My footwork is too fast. My striking, my cardio, you put it all together. I'm a nightmare for Anderson. I always felt that. This is the greatest fighter in the world that we're talking about. The stuff that he did inside the octagon is legendary. I want to be able to say that I fought him and that I beat him. Na verdade, essa luta é mais um desafio mental. Good. Yes, sir. O meu treino ele tá mais inteligente. O treino, claro que não é mais intenso como era antigamente, mas é um treino mais inteligente, é um treino mais estratégico, um treino mais técnico e mais objetivo. He's very focused and he's very motivated. When you mix that up, there's a good chance to see the best Anderson Silva you've ever seen. Tô, tô, tô mais é, 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 empolgado e com mais garra do que antigamente. I mean, that's just amazing. Oh, again. Again. You've got to take it to Anderson. Respect is out of the window. I'm going for one thing only, and that's to beat him in a mixed martial arts fight. And that's not a pretty thing. I'm going to inflict a lot of damage on this guy, believe you me. I will put his career to bed. Dan, I love this bit where we can really peel back the cover and get into the detail of this. Yeah. We're going to set it up with the tail of the tape and look at the physical sizing of these two middleweights. Not a lot really to read between the two of them. Anderson Silva there with a two-inch reach advantage. Yeah, there's not much. I mean, you know, a lot of experience, as you can see, slightly more for Anderson Silva, but, yeah. it, you know, it's inconsequential when it comes to this stage in their career. They've both got a lot of experience. And, I mean, their games are pretty well-rounded as it is. Michael Bisping's slightly higher on the takedowns, whereas obviously we've got the advantage in submissions uh, for Anderson Silva. But th this is really where the story is painted. I mean, look at the significant strikes of Michael Bisping, the leader in the whole of the UFC for significant strikes. So if you fight Michael Bisping, he's going to hit you in the face a lot. That's the bottom line. And the other thing is, well, it's total fight time. I mean, nearly five hours for Michael Bisping. That's a lot of, lot of decisions. That's a lot of 25-minute fights. That's a lot of octagon experience. But then we talk about Anderson Silva, we talk about, I mean, striking accuracy, 64%. He's a finisher, that's, that's the bottom line. You know, he's got, I believe, the most knockdowns in UFC history. He's got, a, a, you know, 12 performance bonuses. He has that, that one strike fight changing quality about him. Whereas Michael Bisping is the workhorse that will just drive you into the ground. You mentioned one fight changing ability for Anderson Silva. Now, longtime fight fans will know that he was wowing crowds right here in London. And at Cage Rage, he put together this immaculate highlight reel KO against Tony Frickland. He did. I was fortunate enough to be right outside the fence when this happened. And 
I mean, to see him go down like that, to see Tony Fricklin get knocked out with an upward elbow that we've just never seen before, particularly at this high level of mixed martial arts, the whole arena went silent. People literally just stood up to just... Trying to comprehend what they're just yeah, seeing. Yeah, yeah. We'd seen him with the organization. He'd had three fights before that. He fought, you know, UFC veterans like Lee Murray and Jorge Rivera. So when he knocked out Tony Fricklin like that in the first round, people were like, all right, we've got to see him step up now. We need to see where he sits on the international rankings. We need to see him in the UFC. And then his next fight, he knocked out Chris Lieben and got his title shot. And there was really no stopping him from that point. I mean, he's just gone from one, one great performance to another. And really it all starts off with that time fighting on Cage Rage in London. And that's what makes this so intriguing because this fight is happening in London where all that history was Definitely. created. So let's take a look at Michael Bisbing then. And one thing that we know about Michael is his output. It is of the highest level. The stats referred to it earlier. Yeah. His cardiovascular condition and he's, he's second to none in the UFC. We see that by the significant strikes landed and by the total fight time, the amount of time he's spent in the octagon. Now, if you watch Michael Bisping, you're going to know that he's going to throw a lot of strikes, but he will look for that one strike that changes the landscape of the fight. And in this Kung Lee fight, it was the lead jab. It was the counter jab, caught him right in the cheekbone and, and really changed the fight for Kung Lee. At this point, he's trying to clear his eye, he's trying to regroup. Michael Bisping smells the victory, so he, he circles into the center and starts piling that pressure on. Now, credit to Kung Lee, this went into the fourth round, and Michael Bisping kept that pressure on, kept that work rate up. But this last combination that started the end of the fight, was it was just relentless. It, it never ended. I mean, it, it's 14 strikes, but these are only the, the ones that, I'm, that landed cleanly. Okay. The ones that he hit on gloves and stuff, I'm not counting them, but they do play a factor. He's hitting with circular shots, so he's landing on the sides of Kung Lee, so he's slowly bringing his guard out to open the opportunity for that knee to come straight up the center. You'll see it in a second. Circular punches, opens his guard up, and then he clinches, throws a beautiful knee up the center, and he drops to the canvas. And that is Michael Bisping. You know, he lands that one shot, he sees the finish, and then he starts chasing it. And even if it doesn't come in that round, even if it's not the next round, he's not discouraged because he knows that he's already got the advantage in the fight now. And in this fight against, against uh, Dolloway, you can, see, you can see his eagerness to get the fight finished. He'll put himself in harm's way he'll put himself within range of getting, getting hit because he knows he's got a good chin. And this fight was, it was an interesting one as well because this was a very emotional fight. There was a lot of trash talking before this. Jason Miller's a, a very polarizing character and Michael Bisping didn't like him at all. So there was a danger of him getting too caught up in this fight. And you can see here, he's standing on the outside just picking him apart. Uh, Jason Miller had no answers for it. And that really is what defines Michael Bisping's fighting style. It's a high pressure, high work rate style that's gonna throw a lot of firepower at you. He's like a sports car who's always on the red line, isn't exactly. he? The whole way through. Always on the red line. But conversely, Anderson Silva is more like a Muay Thai fighter. Yes, he can put the pedal down and, and rev it up, but actually there are moments of calm in his fights. Yeah, Anderson's very good at controlling the pace. He's very good at slowing the fight down and picking his shots. And what this allows him to do is it allows him to read his opponent, read their movements, and then start setting them up and laying traps. And this is why it's so beautiful to watch Anderson Silva. He doesn't go, oh, I'm going to throw this combination and just throw it. He's yeah. thinking, look at his eyes now, he's focusing. He's Everything making you tamed. think that he's going to throw that one shot. And if you look at the pressure, look at the anticipation on these guys' faces. It's dramatic. They're like, they just don't know what's going to happen. And you've got to think, Yushin Okami is in the same state now. He gets turned to the fence, watch this deep breath he takes. <sighs> oh no, I'm against the fence with Anderson Silva. And a second later, Anderson Silva throws that right hook that's game, set, and match. And he'd already set him, set him up for that in the first round. I mean, that's not the first time he threw that punch. He hit him twice with it in the first round. He knew it was there. Against Stefan Bonner, he'd played with him for the first part of the fight, and now he'd got wrist control. He turned him off the fence, and he, he trips him to try and get the fight to the floor, but reactively, he rushes him as soon as uh, Stefan Bonner tries to get to, the, get to his feet. And you see Anderson Silva flying at you when, for the first two minutes of the fight, you've not been able to touch him. You get this kind of reaction. Now look at Vitor here. Anderson Silva's eye line is focused on Vitor's leg. He's selling him a story here. He's telling him that he's going to kick that leg. And then this happens. Ball Amazing. To, to the chin. So look at, look at Vitor Belfort's eye line. He's looking Anderson Silva right in the eye. So he's focused. He's trying to figure out what Anderson Silva's doing, but his peripheral vision will pick up the rest of his body. As soon as he sees Anderson Silva's back foot move, he's expecting a low kick because that's what Anderson Silva sold him. So as he's getting kicked in the face, he's blocking a low kick, which is not there. That is, that's the story that Anderson Silva sold him. He bought it, he, put, he went all in on it, and he got knocked out for his troubles. And this is what makes Anderson Silva so special. Now, we're not talking about anyone here. We're talking about Vitor Belfort. We're talking about the guy that's got the most knockouts in UFC history. The guy that's got that fast, flurry knockout over, over Vanderlei Silva that's been on 
every highlight reel the UFC have ever made. He's a game changer, and that's what Michael Bisping's got to be aware of. If Vitor Belfort wasn't quick enough to react, is Michael Bisping perhaps quick enough? I don't know what, Michael, what game Michael Bisping's going to play. He might go the hard-headed route and try and stand and trade with, like, with Anderson Silva. He might think that his work rate will just wear Anderson Silva okay. down. But the other, the other option that he has is his counter-striking. He's an experienced striker. He's been in there against a lot of different guys, and he's had a lot of different looks. And he's good at stepping in and landing clean shots and then moving away and getting out of the way. He's good, got good head movement, he's got good footwork, good lateral movement, which I'll come back to in a second. But just watch how he moves around his opponent, how he keeps his head out of danger but still lands clean shots. You've got to think how frustrating that is. And I don't think it was, it was, he had a better performance than when he did against, uh, against uh, um, Alan Belcher. I mean, you could see Belcher slowly as the fight progressed, he was starting to get more and more frustrated. As he steps forward, he's get, getting hit. As he's swinging, he's missing. And Michael Bisping is just able to move around him. Watch this beautiful lateral movement here. Now, watch the clean strikes that are landed and, and the, the amount of strikes that Alan Belcher throws that miss, that don't land on anything. He gets hit with a clean shot there and uh, Michael Bisping's still moving. He slips out the way of a big right hand and steps in and lands two more clean shots. So it almost feels like you're fighting a ghost when you're swinging and you're not, and you're not hitting. And then when he comes back and lands a couple of clean shots and when he can keep this work rate up for the duration of the fight, there's always that, that possibility that he's going to land that one shot like he did against Kung Lee that changes the fight. That one shot that startles them, that offsets their, equ their equilibrium, that, that takes the fight out of them in some way. And then Michael Bisping will turn and then he'll start pouring that pressure on. And that's when he gets dangerous. So if he approaches the fight like this against Anderson Silva and tries to draw Anderson Silva in, he may start to use that, use that to, to counter Anderson and catch him as he's moving in. And then he can start using his work rate as the fight goes on. I mean, we've got to remember, this is a five round fight. So he's got to let this play out. He's got to give it some breathing room. Okay. You mentioned in that last run about Bisping being like a ghost. Well, yeah. actually, when I think about Anderson Silva, he's the one who is like a ghost. He's yeah. very elusive. Very, very much so. I mean, this, this might be a fight where you get two guys throwing loads and loads of punches and hardly anything lands because they are both <laughs> very experienced in you know, controlling range. Look how he's measuring with his lead arm. Look how he circles off Yushin Okami, then has to go back and find him beautiful head movement to, to make his opponent miss and make them hesitate. You know, you, you've got to think how it feels to be fighting someone that you've been training for for eight, ten weeks and you feel confident you're going to hit them. And then you get in there. Now he's so hesitant now. Watch this. Anderson Silva disguises this head kick with his left hand. He throws a real lazy one to and, he, and his left leg is on the way up before he's even thrown yeah. his, left, his left hand out. Look, there was no intention of throwing that. That was purely a distraction. And you could see Yushin Okami didn't see the foot until it was right next to his head. Going back to the Stefan Bonner fight, look at this, walked back to the fence. Come Just on, defensive, let's yeah. have another go. I mean, if you listen to the commentary, it's fascinating. Joe Rogan says, if Stefan Bonner is going to win this fight, Anderson Silva's got to stand in front of him and let him hit him. And that's what he was doing. Still didn't work. <laughs> so then we look at this clip. Watch Anderson Silva rush forward now. He's already got Forrest Griffin in a, in a defensive mindset because Forrest has already swung loads of shots and missed. So Anderson backs him up to the fence. Anderson knows this side of the octagon's cut off. He's not going to allow him to step there. So he knows Forrest is going to circle this way. So he can step straight forward into a southpaw stance and he's got his right hook ready to go. And again, Anderson Silva, with the ability to switch stances, opens all these options up to him. We've talked about it with TJ Dillashaw in the past and guys that are able to cut the octagon off because they can switch. And then this head movement, when, when you, you can see now Forrest is starting to hesitate. He's swinging, he's really committing to his punches, but he's still not landing. Got to be frustrating. So then when you're in this situation, you've got two options. You either overcommit and you rush forward like Forrest does just here. You can see how his body's leaning over as he gets hit. He's already on his way down. His momentum's already forward. Or the other option is you can get hesitant. You can hold back. Then Anderson Silva's going to come and find you. And is that an Anderson Silva you want to deal with? I mean, it's, you know, the lesser of two evils. You've got you to flip the coin and make a choice. All right, well, let's look at a different angle then. If striking's not working for Michael, what does he do then? Well... Brits have got a bad rap for not, not having much wrestling. Probably down to me, partly. <laughs> uh, I'll admit that. But, you know, we've got guys, obviously Michael Bisping, Brad Pickett's another one that comes to yeah. mind. People that have spent time in wrestling camps, people that have rounded out their game. And you can see him, the perfect timing on these double leg takedowns. You see how he, he, he hit there to bring up Brian Stan's hands yeah. up so he could level change underneath. Good timing on his takedowns. Good technique. He penetrates, he drives through. And the confidence that he has in his striking transfers to the wrestling. Having said that, We've seen, we've seen Anderson Silva be taken down in the past, but it's ne not always worked out with the person that's taken him down. <laughs> I think I know what you're about to talk about. <laughs> there we yeah. go. We're, we're going to talk about this. Look at how he's controlling this wrist. Now, he, Chelsea has not even bothered. He's won four rounds at this point. 
Anderson Silva hits him in the face and brings his head down. Now Anderson's starting to try and set up a triangle here. And he knows the only way to keep his head, head down is to keep hitting him. So that's what he does. Nothing significant, but watch him punch over the arm here and then lock it to his chest. A beautiful technique. And then he just throws that up. In a second, he's in a triangle. He was two minutes away from getting the, 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 the middleweight title wrapped around his waist. And Anderson Silva stole it away from him. No one was more disappointed and shocked than Chael Sonnen in that fight. Even his corner was telling him, one more perfect round and you've got the belt. It's yeah. fantastic stuff. Mm. Still lots more to cover with this main event, but we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Dan steps into the octagon and takes a hands-on approach to where he thinks the fight can be won or lost. And later in the programme, our special guests, Noel Clark and Nick Peets, join us to give us their view on the upcoming fight night. England's own Michael Bisping will have the backing of the home crowd as he takes on former middleweight champion Anderson Silva. Time now for Dan to take a closer look at the fight styles and tactics as we go on the mat. The truth is this is a real treat for me to break down this fight. I've been a fan of both guys for a long time. But first I want to focus on Michael Bisping. As we discussed in the fight focus section, moving towards Anderson Silva without any kind of plan is a very dangerous tactic. So Michael Bisping is gonna have to disguise his movement forward and his attack if he's gonna have any success in this fight. And the one thing that Michael Bisping uses very well is his smoke screen, his lead hand. He uses it to confuse his opponent, he uses it to turn their head away from his attack, and he uses it to disguise whatever he's trying to do, whatever he's trying to land behind that technique. The best example of this is in the Alan Belcher fight, and you'll see as Michael Bisping moves forward, He's not really trying to land his lead hand too much. He's just trying to keep it in Alan Belcher's face so Alan can't see what's coming behind it. And he lands his right hand cleanly over and over again during that fight to the point where it starts to really frustrate Alan Belcher. So let me explain this technique in a bit more detail. I've got my beautiful assistant Dean here to help me. Um, and I'm gonna use Dean to, to basically demonstrate how this technique is beneficial for Michael Bisping. Now, obviously if I'm moving towards Dean and I'm stepping forward, he can see what I'm doing right now. If I just put my hand in front of his face, I can step in behind it. Now he knows I'm moving, but he can't, he can't distinguish exactly what I'm doing. So I can use that to disguise whatever technique I decide to throw. Now, Michael Bisping likes his right hand. He's very good at placing the right hand right on the chin. And the way he lands this is behind this smoke screen that he uses. Now, a lot of people will pump a jab with power. So the hand will come back to the shoulder before it fires out again. That's where you're gonna get the most maximum power. But in this case, I'm not trying to hit him with power. I'm trying to distract him for this punch. So all I need to do is make sure that this hand is in his face. So I'm gonna do a lazy jab over his eyes. And what that's gonna do is allow me to step into range and land my big right hand on his chin. And that's the benefit of the smoke screen. Obviously, there's a benefit in using that smoke screen to land that right hand, but there are other benefits as well. And covering distance against Anderson Silva is key. If you cover distance too quickly, he's gonna catch you. If you don't cover distance enough, you're not gonna get a hand on him. So you have to disguise that movement forward. So by using the smoke screen to disguise the right hand, he can also bring his feet behind him as well and close that distance down on Anderson Silva and effectively push him back over his heels. The first time Chris Weidman stepped near against Anderson Silva, You'll hear it in his corner, his corner man said, I want you to punch a hole in his chest. That's what I want. As Weidman moves forward, he takes his feet with him, he keeps his feet underneath his hips, so he stays strong and he stays balanced. And when Anderson Silva is using his head movement to try and get out of the way, he becomes overextended and he gets caught with that shot that finishes the fight. So let's assume Anderson Silva is moving backwards. Dean is going to demonstrate Anderson Silva for me. I'm going to move forward with my double jab right now, as, as Michael Bisping will. One, two. Now, given the fact that I was distracting him as I was moving forward with my jab, I've been able to bring my feet with me. So you can see Dean's heels are in line now. Anderson Silva's heels are in line now. So as I go to throw my right hand, he can't slip any further back, and I'm going to land that punch and knock him off his heels. And if you watch the Chris Weidman fight, that's the best example of that punch. So 
So if we talk about Michael Bisping moving forward with success, we've got to talk about Anderson Silva moving backwards with success. Now, obviously, the Chris Weidman fight wasn't a good account of what Anderson Silva is capable of. If you watch early fights in his career, you'll see him using that head movement to create space to get his opponents to overcommit to strikes because they keep missing him. The best example of this is the Forrest Griffin fight. And Forrest was so frustrated at the end of this fight, so overwhelmed by Anderson Silva's ability. He's thrown probably 30 punches at Anderson Silva and not landed a single thing. So now he's starting to get desperate. Now he's starting to feel like he needs to push forward further and cover more distance. And when he starts to do this, then that's when he exposes himself. And with Anderson Silva using his good reaction time and his good head movement, he's very good at moving away and creating voids, creating traps for his opponents to walk into so he can catch them as they walk onto a powerful shot. So let's assume that Michael Bisping is charging forward on Anderson Silva. He's not judging the space very well. He's allowing Anderson Silva to control the range. The, the danger with Anderson Silva is that you can swing and swing and swing and miss over and over again. But Anderson Silva has got the quickest reaction time as you'll ever see. He can read a person as they're moving forward and find that target to switch the person off. Imagine Dean's Michael Bisping here. As he's moving forward, Anderson Silva is going to step out of the way and slip these punches and then catch him. And the more punches you throw in that combination, the more you're going to reach. So Anderson Silva is going to let you throw three or four punches and then he's going to nail you as you're moving forward. And because your momentum's crashing into his fist, there's nothing you can do about it. Lastly, and possibly most importantly, I want to break down this particular technique. And this is the one I've been looking forward to. We talked about it on the Fight Focus. It's the front kick knockout that he used against Vitor Belfort. If you watch Vitor Belfort, you can see how hesitant he is against Anderson Silva. Pay attention to the eye line. You can see Anderson Silva staring at Vitor Belfort's front leg. Whereas if you look at Vitor Belfort, he's focused on Anderson Silva's eye line. He's paying attention to what Anderson Silva's thinking about, not what he's thinking about, which allows Anderson Silva to sell him the idea of the low kick before he kicks him in the face. So in the history of finishes in the UFC, this is by far my top five. I love this technique, and Anderson Silva executed it perfectly. What I want to talk about is how the eye line can sell a technique. Now, me and Dean right now, we're facing each other. But if I look at Dean's front leg, he's going to acknowledge that I'm picking that out as a target. Now, what Dean's expecting is this. I'm looking at his front leg, and then I'm going to throw a low kick to the inside of his leg. Dean's doing the right thing because he's going to check it. He doesn't want to take that kick to the inside of his leg. He wants to block it with his shin. That's the correct thing to do. But if I can draw his attention to that, make him think I'm doing that, and then do something else instead, I can open a target up that he's not expecting. And that's what he did against Vitor Belfort. So here, pay attention, my eye line is on Dean's front leg. So he is thinking that that is my target. Now, because he's focused on my eye line, he can only see my back foot in his peripheral vision. So when he sees it move, because I'm looking at the leg, he's expecting the low kick to come. So he lifts his front leg up. Instead, I'm coming straight up, bang, snap him right in the face. And it's basically just Anderson Silva has sold him that technique. He has convinced him that he's going to throw the low kick purely by looking at it. Anderson Silva has this air of confidence about him that gives people anxiety. They don't know what he's going to do, so they stand and wait to see what he's planning. And that is the worst thing you can do. If Michael Bisping is going to win this fight, if he's going to put pressure on Anderson Silva, he has to fight his game. If Anderson Silva starts to dictate the pace of this fight, he's going to start laying traps and catching Michael Bisping with some of these special techniques that he uses. Love that. Excellent stuff. Time now for a quick break. But when we come back, Noel Clark and Nick Peet join us to give their views on this historic main event. And we preview the best of the rest from Fight Night London. Silva, Michael Bisping. Here we go! 
time now for The Face Off, and we're joined by two very special guests. First up, the editor of Fighter Sony Magazine, Nick Pete. Thank you for joining us in the Breakdown Studios. And Noel Clark, film director, fight fanatic, and good friend of Michael Bisping. Welcome to UFC Breakdown. Thanks for having me. So, Noel, firstly to you, let's talk about that main event. I understand you know a little bit about what Anderson Silva is in for because you took a full-on shot from Mr Bisping not so long ago. Yeah, he keeps teasing me because I'm dining out on it. You know, it's like my fame to fame now. We, uh, yeah, we were shooting a movie. Um, he was the main villain in, in the movie that I directed uh, a couple of years ago. And we're doing these really cool action scenes and he took a swing and he just clocked me right on the jaw, <laughs> right on the jaw. And I just went down, everyone started shouting medic, you know, and I got up like that, like, you know, well chuffed that I'd taken one off this thing and got up, <laughs> you know. But yeah, I, my jaw was, was messed up for a few days, definitely. How's he doing ahead of this one? Yeah, I mean, I think he's doing great. He's prepared. I think, like, in terms of his career, he's had so many great fights, so many big fights. But this, we all know, this is this is a big fight. And I feel like for Michael, who I think unfairly has never had a title shot, I'm not saying this literally puts you in that position, but I feel like if he's fighting people that are obeying the rules, you know, then essentially he should have had and this could set him on his way. Nick, on that theme of big fights, I think Michael said that this is a bucket list fight for him. How big is this fight? Well, Noel's right. This fight probably should have happened five years ago as far as Mike Bisping is concerned. But this, make no mistake, this is the biggest fight of his entire yeah. career. You know, he's, he's coming back to the UK. This is his big swan song performance. You know, how many fights has Mike got left in him? You know, I wouldn't be surprised if this is the last time we see him fight, certainly on British shores. And this is the one he's always wanted, you know? And, you know, Noel's right, the winner of this fight has got a, a great shot at getting a, a, a title shot later in the year. But uh, it's about who turns up on the night, what Mike Bisman's going to turn up, and more importantly, what Anderson Silva's going to turn up as well. Yeah. Silva's last performance against Nick Diaz, what did you take from that? Um, if I was in Mike Bisman's corner, everything in the world, because it was a shadow of the fighter he once was, you know? Anderson Silva was untouchable during his middleweight reign. Before he ran into Chris Wyatt, and nobody could get close to Anderson Silva, and people would lose a fight. You know, Dan, Dan will agree, people lose the fight before the fight even begins, because psychologically, you're taking on an aura, you're taking on a legend, you're taking on an icon. But Chris Weidman wiped that away, you know, mm. he cleaned the slate. That's, that's what makes this fight so intriguing, because Anderson Silva, we don't know what version of this 40-year-old Anderson Silva is going to turn up in London. Yeah. But we know what version of Mike Bisping's going to turn up. The very best Mike Bisping. Yeah. You, you've, got to think that, you've got to think that Anderson Silva's got to have something to prove, though. He's got to feel like he's got to kind of regain that, uh, you know, that status that he had before. For me, Michael's endurance is Weidman-esque. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I feel like Michael's endurance is like, he just doesn't stop. And I don't know if, you know, I, I, I'm not one to, to talk about power, because like I said, I got up from one, you know, joking. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Mike, I'm joking. <laughs> um, no, it's amazing power, but, you know, his endurance is, is, is something that I'm not sure that this Anderson can cope with. Have you enjoyed his verbal sparring with Anderson Silva ahead of this one? He's been on good form. Mate, I love Mike. He, he can do no wrong for me. He's a mate of mine, so, you know, I've enjoyed everything. And I enjoy, I'll enjoy the fight. You're going to have to stop me from jumping in if it goes, <laughs> goes wrong. <laughs> so, Dan, let's talk about the middleweight picture then. Where does this main event sit for you? It's, it's an essential fight for this, for this middleweight division. I mean... In my opinion, the middleweight division has never been as competitive as it is now. That top four is a shark tank. For me, I need one of the fighters to step up there and start, start mixing in amongst that group and start breaking it up a little bit. And the winner of this fight is going to be that person. We're either going to see Anderson Silva step back in there and go after that belt again and start fighting some of these new up-and-coming uh, contenders, or we get to see Michael Bisping finally get to that stage where he's going to, he's going to you know, be within reach of a title shot. I I'm excited for both. No, a prediction then. Who's going to win and how's it going to happen? <laughs> how's it going to happen? I have no idea. I mean, I have to, for, for many reasons, I have to go for Mike. I feel like, you know, he, he's on home, home soil. You know, the endurance he has is, is unparalleled with some, you know, in, in the UFC. And also for me, Anderson, Anderson is not the man he used to be. Nick, moving on to you, same question. Yeah, the, we did a straw poll in the latest issue of Fighters Only, actually, and we, act, we asked a bunch of fighters, a bunch of coaches from around the world for their opinions on a fight. Overwhelmingly, they chose Michael Bisping. Really? Yeah, they really did. And the, the, the driving factors seem to be people just don't know what version of Anderson Silva is left. But okay. they know that Michael Bisping's coming to the party, all guns blazing. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go that way. You know, I think the longer the fight goes on, 
I've got to go with Bisping. I think, you know, he's just got to dig in there for the first round and, and, and not give Anderson the space he needs to work and just jump on top of him. And I think we could see a big upset. OK. Well, let's take a look at some of the other fights on the card. And another Brit who is preparing to fight on home soil is East London's own Brad One Punch Pickett. How's the body feeling today, Brad? Not bad, not bad. Not bad. Yeah. So first off, I'm going for a nice time at warm-up. Um, a warm-up's not just to prep his body, it's also to try and work on his robustness and try and build some real strength. Go! Go! I'm in camp. Come on. I can't always stay in relatively good shape, because I, I say there's always a road back. If you go away for too long, you can make, just make that road back longer, you know? Especially with my age and doing a bit more strength and conditioning rather than spying as hard as I used to when I was young. Let's do this. Now in my career, sometimes a lot of it is about injury management. This is what they help me do, like keep my body in shape and uh, like primed and ready to go. One, two, three. Four, five. Good. Got to get done, mate. Done. You motivate yourself in different ways. When I first started fighting, my motivation was to prove myself, prove that I can fight. Next thing, I want to sign, get signed to a big show. Then I want to show people I can compete in the top ten. They get top five, and then try and get a title shot. They've always been my motivations, but now I've been there for such a long time. My motivation has changed. I don't need to prove myself anymore. I know I can fight. My motivation is now is different things. My family, you know, my, my kid now, I, I see this is my job. Uh, my, my wife now is on maternity leave. I need to win to put food on the table for my family, you know. Over to that wall? Yeah. And then over to the other? I'm taking every fight as it comes with my body. When you get old, sometimes you think, oh, I'm too old for this. Like, I, and I must admit, it gets hard on my body after training session, after training session. When you've been in the game for so long, when you go in the gym, you're that guy with a target on your back. All the young guys go, that's the guy I want to roll with. That's the guy I want to try and beat up. You know, sometimes you're just like, man, leave me alone, you know? So, like, it's tough. Training with these young guys who are so athletic, you know, so athletic and so good, they drive you on even more, you know? That. Fighting out of London, England, Brad One Punch Pickets! I'm very proud to be a Londoner, you know? I'm born and bred from London. Just to fight, effectively, my backyard, you know, in front of a maxed out crowd. No better feeling, you know, especially coming away with a W. So strong. Oh! Look at that uppercut from Pickett! Being 37. I'm thinking about it. this could be my last fight in the O2 in the UFC. If that's the case, I want to make sure it's a fight to remember. So, Nick, I'll come to you about Brad Pickett first of all, then. He's been a really big part of the growth of the UFC and mixed martial arts in this region. But is this a do or die fight for him? Um, I think it's more than that. I think it's a swan song. I think win, lose, or draw, this is probably the last time we're going to see Brad Pickett inside really? the octagon. Yeah, I think this could be his big, his big uh, fairy tale ending. Um, I think the London fans are going to get something a bit special. There's a reason why Brad Pickett's one of Dana White's favourite fighters. The guy is super entertaining. He's totally well-rounded. We're going to get tons of action, tons of explosivity, but more... Brad Pickett's the man. He's the one that's going to light this card on fire for me. I feel for Rivera in some way, because I feel like he's got a part to play and he's got no choice what part he's going to play. I'm expecting big things from Brad Pickett. Dan, you were nodding through a couple of those responses there. Uh, this is a replacement fighter for Brad in this, in this fight. Is Rivera perhaps a tougher prospect? I definitely think so. I think he's so much better than, than, his, than his record shows, and I think that Brad Pickett is really up against it in this fight. I mean, obviously, he's going to want to go out with, with a bang. He's going to want to put on a great performance, but there are easier fights to have to put on a great performance. And this is going to... He's going to have to dig deep. He's going to have to really dig into, the, into his skill set and, and uh, find out what he's made of. Okay. No, as a fan of, of Brad Pickett, he's fighting in his backyard. Yeah. This is awesome. It is awesome. And I think, you know, Brad's been brilliant over the years. You know, great fighter, obviously, but also entertaining. You know, one of the reasons some people I know that are more casual fans watch it is when he used to come out with his little newspaper and his hat and stuff like that. And it's almost like you were saying earlier, it's almost like a wrestling entrance. Do you know what I mean? And it brings that entertainment factor. And, and people love that. And I, I think he can do it. You know, he's not called one punch for no reason. No. You know. No. 
Gentlemen, let's move it on to the co-main event then. Tullers Laces versus Gay Guard Musasi. Nick, I'm going to come to you first. What can we expect from this matchup? Uh, it's a good matchup. Two veterans, tons of experience in the game. It's an interesting fight, an intriguing fight. Uh, it's one that kind of, it's a, it, it's a, you know, the loser leaves town almost. It kind of feels like both guys have been around for so long. You know, have been in the industry. I, I wouldn't like to be the loser in this fight because you're going to tumble out to the top 15, top 20. It's an important matchup for both these guys, and stylistically, they match up very well. Both very well rounded. So it's a, it's a cool co-main event actually. Yeah, Dan, tell us latest. His striking game's really evolved, but he's coming up against a world-class kickboxer in Musasi. He, he is, but you know their, their skill sets are very inter interesting when they interact with each other. I mean, we know Musasi's a, a good ranged striker. He's good at keeping people on the feet. He's very, very patient. He's good at taking people apart and, and trying to predict what they're going to do and setting them up. Tell us latest. Since he's been back in the UFC, he's, he's looked a lot more aggressive. Even, even a, little, a little reckless, but it's working out for him. I like that aggression, and it shows the confidence that he's getting in his striking skills. There's no doubt about it that his ground skills are, is what sets him apart, though, from most of the division. But as you were saying, you know, this, I mean, this, this is a fight for relevance more than anything. And on this night, is a co-main event with Anderson Silva as the headline. It's a good opportunity to make a statement in the middleweight division because a lot of middleweights are going to have their eyes on this, on this card. OK. Well, I want to talk about another fight. Tom Breeze versus Keita Nakamura. And Dan, coming to you on this one, we called Tom Breeze's last fight against Cahal Pendred, and he was the name on our lips as we left the arena that night. Yeah, I've got goosebumps just thinking about it. He, he, was, he, was a, he showed himself to be a very, very special athlete that night. Um, he's, a, he's a massive welterweight. He's very good at maintaining range and picking people apart from distance. And if you look at his, first, his two UFC fights so far, he's waited till the end of the first round, and he just jumps on them and smashes them out of the water. That shows, that shows a, a, a maturity in his game, I think, because he has the skills to step in there and just smoke them in the first minute, no doubt. And I think, to be honest, Nakamura is going to be up against the same kind of challenge. But what it shows is it, it shows a discipline in his game to, to, to be patient, to not rush in and not make those mistakes. The Penjad performance for me was... Outstanding. That was a fight that he called for. He wanted that fight. He seen that Pendred was tailor made for his style. Destroyed him, let's be honest with you. That was a completely one sided performance. Brees is a complete student of the game. He absolutely loves the game. Yeah. You know, he's over in Tristar in Montreal, but he's on his own. He's not with his friends, not with his family. He won in Dublin. He never went back to Birmingham to celebrate with friends and family. He was on the next flight to Montreal, back in training. A week later, he was in Los Angeles in the Nogi World Championships, where he won a silver medal, which is incredible for a guy that's got... That just shows how much passion he's got and how big his expectations are in this sport. And that submission side to his game will be key for this fight in London, I believe, as well. Keita Nakamura, though, is he a big enough challenge? Uh, on the ground, he is, yeah. His ground game is outstanding. You know, he's an ADCC veteran, uh, Senduko champion, deep champion, tons of experience out of Japan. You know, we, we're, we're getting super excited about Tom Breeze over here, but the Japanese have got a lot of faith in this guy as well. They think he could be that one breakthrough star that J Japan's desperate for in the UFC. It's a super exciting division, especially for Europe. You know, not only have we got Tom, we've got uh, Danny Roberts, we've got J uh, Darren Till. Uh, Nicholas Dalby, you know, it's super exciting. The 170-pound weight class, from a European perspective, is red hot, but, but Tom's the main man right at the front. Yeah. I wouldn't think that he, he would be at a, a massive disadvantage in the top five at welterweight. I really think he could hold his own against, you know, guys like Condit and Alves and people like that. And that is you know, a shark tank. That is a shark <laughs> tank. But, I mean, imagine him fighting Condit. That would be an amazing fight. Two range strikers would really get to see him tested then. Lots of questions, I'm sure we all agree, but also it's going to be a really memorable night in London. Thank you, gentlemen. Very much enjoyed that. Thanks to Nick and to Noel for joining us here in studio. Well, if you want to find out where you can watch UFC Fight Night in your region, then head on over to UFC.com and get involved on social media. Tweet us at UFC Europe using the hashtag UFC London. Don't forget, we will be previewing the next Fight Night in Zagreb right here on UFC Breakdown, so join us for that. But for now, it's goodbye from us. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the UFC, and we are back in London. And we are underway.